Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled Improving Rodent Cardiovascular Research Outcomes with Integrated Surgical Monitoring. My name is Andy Henson from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Today's session is the fifth installment in our PV Loops to Measure Cardiac Function webinar series and is somewhat of an extension from our previous event which focused on best practices for obtaining stable and consistent PV Loop data. Specifically, today we will discuss surgical monitoring best practices and in finer detail learn about the importance of controlling core body temperature and breathing rate while monitoring additional physiological signals such as ECG and blood oxygenation. Our first presenter today is Dr. James Clark, Program Director for the Master's Degree in Human and Applied Physiology at King's College London. Dr. Clark's research interests include the application of both in vivo and in vitro physiological and molecular techniques to investigate the response of the myocardium to the stresses of ischemia, reperfusion, and trophy. And it is in these pursuits that he has developed a passion for surgical best practices and rodent models of cardiovascular disease, with specific interest regarding the effects of varying core body temperature. Following, we will be joined by Graham Sattler, Product Development Manager at Indus Instruments. Over the past five years, Graham has become heavily involved in the study and application of vital signs monitoring in the preclinical research space, and has led the design efforts for both legacy heating and surgical monitoring products at Indus and their new flagship mouse monitor product line. Today he will be speaking on some of the specific monitoring processes presented by Dr. Clark and in addition will be providing video demonstration on how some of these key processes can be achieved using the mouse monitor S system. Thank you very much for that introduction Andy and also thank you to Inside Scientific and Indus for inviting me uh, to present today. Um, I'm going to give you about 30 minutes of uh, my thoughts on surgical monitoring I'm going to show you some of our practice that we use at the BHF Centre at King's College in London, um, show you some data both from the literature and from our own labs that maybe emphasizes that uh, as best as we can, um, but also bring up a few, a few questions that perhaps some of us uh, in the industry haven't thought about, uh, and maybe we should. And then hopefully this will lead on to some discussion um, after the, the webinar and also during uh, Graham's presentation after me. So uh, let's just set the scene uh, where we are. Um, we're, we're not talking about uh, implantation of um, osmotic pumps. We're not talking about basic surgery and, and simple skin incisions uh, and short-term recovery procedures. What we're really focused on here is looking at uh, relatively complicated surgery and in particular surgery that is going to um, impact on the cardiovascular hemodynamics or respiratory function of the surgical model. So I've just shown here three examples of the kind of work that we're doing at King's, um, looking at either abdominal aortic banding or thoracic aortic banding. Um, the classic myocardial infarction by suturing the left anterior descending coronary artery um, and the PV loop acquisition that we're all uh, familiar with. Uh, and what I wanted to emphasize here is really that we as, as surgeons are focused on these small parts. We're not really well equipped to be focusing on the animal as a whole, um, but we all know that effective monitoring is the only way to keep an eye on what is going on um, inside the mouse whether it's the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, or just general health and well-being. Our clinical colleagues will tell us that we need to measure a lot, and if any of you work in the clinical field, you'll know the degree of monitoring that's undertaken in ITU, ICU, coronary care units, uh, and other uh, clinical theatres. Um, we would like to mirror that, of course, we would in our murine or rodent studies. Um, but we came up with this list of what we consider essential, desirable, and optional for murine monitoring, and certainly the essential monitoring will be temperature, uh, core temperature, um, rather than environmental temperature. And in my opinion, and in the opinion of most of my colleagues, ECG is a prerequisite uh, to undertake surgery. And with a standard limb lead 2 ECG, we can also use chest impedance to calculate respiratory rate. So we then enter the desirable phase and we start looking at respiration, uh, perhaps measuring oxygen saturation using a um, peripheral oxygen saturation probe. And of course, if we're doing invasive measures uh, such as pressure volume loops uh, and, and such, we are also measuring blood pressure. Um, I think down the very bottom we've got an optional 
And of course, uh, over time, we've all uh, dabbled in various other measures, and certainly respiratory gases, end-tidal oxygen, end-tidal CO2, is a very useful measure to have, especially if what you're doing may be impacting on the respiratory system and the um, pulmonary perfusion system. Uh, and also peripheral blood flow may be an optional extra. So given that this is what our clinical colleagues measure in every patient uh, on the ward, uh, we must, I think, strive to try and achieve at least the desirable stage of this uh, schematic in order to monitor our mice effectively during surgery. Um, we at St. Thomas's in the BHF Center are very fortunate to have a, a large array of equipment uh, to use for these uh, mouse procedures. We've got a purpose-developed Miron operating table, which I'll talk about in a minute. But certainly the essentials for PV surgery, which is where we're really focused here, is to have a good quality operating table and microscope. Um, the microscope isn't optional in my opinion. I think a lot of people try and do um, pressure volume work without a microscope and to be honest you do need to see where you're putting your catheter quite effectively to get good loops and I know the previous presenter talked about that a little bit. Um, we need to consider homeothermic platforms, temperature regulation and then we look at physiological monitoring. Um, of course, you need a PV catheter and an acquisition system, suitable anesthetic machines, uh, ventilation where appropriate. Um, there are advocates out there of free breathing uh, mouse PV and of course there are also advocates of um, intubated PV and both have their advantages and your array of surgical instruments. When you talk to many people undertaking pressure volume loops, their priority seems to be to get good PV loops uh, and not on the actual physiological monitoring. And this is what we're going to spend some time now talking about. So this is just a, a series of pictures just to remind us all what it is that we're looking for when we're looking at effective surgical monitoring. You've got your data acquisition system and uh, we use the AD instrument system you can see there and we use the transonic uh, advantage system uh, from SciSense and transonic to do our PV acquisition. You need ECG monitoring and we have adopted two styles in our institute. We both use both the uh, needle electrodes, the stainless steel needle electrodes, which you can just implant under the skin, or we have started using on larger animals, especially in rats, we've started using uh, conductive rubber, which you can wrap around the pore, fill with conductive gel, and it collects a very good ECG without the need for an incision or implanting a needle electrode. And we're moving that over to mice now. Um, and of course you need a temperature controller unit. And again, showing the images we have here, we have a variety of um, voltage operated uh, heat mats, um, T-type thermistors and various acquisition devices. And all of this together can actually cost a very large amount of money for a research lab uh, that is only doing small amounts of animal research. But in honesty, it's, it's required for effective surgical monitoring in the absence of a standalone system. One of the key problems with murine surgery is the murine blood volume. Being at only around 1.9 to 2 milliliters, it doesn't take a particularly large incision to end up causing some uh, severe problems in maintenance of blood pressure. Um, of course, most of the procedures that we're doing in terms of pressure volume are accessing high pressure chambers such as the left ventricle or in this case you can see on the screen a carotid artery and part of the skill involved in the surgical side of these procedures is to guarantee a bloodless field. Easier said than done um, and especially when you're cannulating a carotid artery which is obviously at 120 or so millimeters of mercury pressure sometimes it, this can be um, the Achilles heel of a surgeon um, but I would advocate uh, training to ensure a, a blood-free surgical field uh, and then perhaps consider a fluid support system. Um, there is lots of data in the literature looking at different fluid supports. This is a, a very elegant paper published almost 14, 13 years ago now um, in the American Journal of Physiology where they looked at the application of different uh, fluids. In this case they show some data from um, starch and saline solutions perfused at a, at a fairly universally accepted flow rate into a, into a mouse. Uh, and they demonstrate that, uh, you can see on the graphs, if I just show my mouse here, uh, with no fluid support at all, the heart dry weight ratio and pressure is maintained at normal. But as you start to perfuse um, either, in this case, hydroxyethyl uh, starch, 
and saline, you end up with slow increases in heart mass, which for those of you working with hearts, cardiac hypertrophy or infarction, you can immediately see is going to affect uh, your data. Uh, and for those working with blood pressure as their primary endpoint, you can see that simply by perfusing what is in, in fact a very low perfusion rate of either crystalloid or colloid solution can dramatically impact, uh, in this case statistically significant, but really physiologically significant is probably the best thing to say. You can see it's going to impact on your blood pressure. So we need to try and maintain normal blood volume, and I put that in inverted commas because that is probably the hardest thing to guesstimate or anticipate during a surgical procedure. And many of us will do a preemptive strike and do an IP infusion of a drug or a, a liquid before um, surgery. Others may try and attack halfway and, and do some kind of fluid support. But this could be administered IP or IV. Obviously, during a recovery procedure, you wouldn't want to administer IV. It's a, a, a quite a difficult thing to have to close. But IP solutions tend to uh, infuse fairly well. They tend to be well tolerated by mice. Uh, and it's not uncommon uh, to need to uh, inject half a mil to 800 microliters of, of saline solution into a mouse after procedure to try and maintain uh, hydration. Um, of course, care should be taken not to overhydrate. Um, certainly, it's, this isn't the forum to point fingers or report other people's data, but there is plenty of literature evidence out there to show what many would describe as super mice, mice with uh, supra-physiological uh, readings and incredibly high blood pressures caused by overhydration, um, overambitious uh, fluids is a very dangerous thing. Uh, it will also obviously impact on your mouse's or your rodent's health upon recovery. Of course, the reason we want to maintain good uh, blood pressure is because we need to be measuring good blood pressure. Uh, this is just an example of what we'd expect to see during an abdominal IVC occlusion during a standard PV data acquisition. Um, we need to be maintaining high, uh, decent uh, physiological systolic pressures, and we certainly don't want to be impacting on the ability of the heart to respond to varying preload or varying afterload. Um, needless to say, if your interest is in heart failure or your interest is in the response to myocardial infarction, the last thing you want your animal to be is overhydrated where they already have a high afterload to fight against uh, even before you've started inducing injury or during measurements. Uh, and we have this all the time as problems. It's, it's very easy uh, to miss clear signs of dehydration um, while doing these measurements. And obviously, if you've had a bleed of any kind during the surgery, um, it's cautionary to use cautery. Um, that should be my motto. Um, but you can use cautery um, within reason to try and minimize blood loss during abdominal surgery. And certainly during thoracic surgery, we tend to use either very careful blood dissection, or if we need to do a non-recovery procedure, we'll, we'll use cautery to minimize uh, fluid loss to try and maintain these kind of parameters. And certainly, I would never advocate anyone um, hydrating a mouse to try and return their hemodynamics back to normal, because in doing so you are affecting blood resistivity and other factors that will impact on your data acquisition, especially when using conductance or admittance catheters. So we are, as I said before, very lucky at the BHF Center at St. Thomas's. We have an array of um, equipment to use in our murine surgical settings. Um, this was my previous uh, surgical suite. We've just moved to a new building. Um, but here we have uh, our standard equipment for both PV and mouse surgical um, interventions where we have our operating table, uh, intubation, ventilator, temperature control system at the back here, um, an acquisition system with the PV monitoring system above it. Um, we've stopped using uh, this type of um, cautery and obviously a computer system and we are we're very lucky to have a inbuilt uh, video system in which we can record and obviously use for teaching all of our procedures and um, we do actually record every procedure we do uh, and then wipe the disk if we don't need it for playback but it's often very useful to have that to playback and I'm sure we are talking about data acquisition and storage uh, later this morning so um, just to talk a little bit about our purpose-built operating table, um, we developed this um, about 10, 15 years ago, and it was originally a rather nice teak piece of teak that we uh, used, varnished and used in the lab. Of course, teak isn't the best uh, medium to use in an animal theater, so we've now got this nice Delrin uh, plastic 
model, uh, which has been refined again since this photo was taken. But essentially, this enables us to have a, uh, a recessed uh, access area where we can lay our rodent. We have a, a rat version and a, and a mouse version. This is the mouse version. Uh, this allows for the use of a nose cone, uh, an integrated ventilator, which can be used then to ventilate the animal through um, direct access into the uh, trachea. We have pin boards on either side for retraction, and the newer model we have has magnetic boards for use of uh, magnetic retractors. And then this, this blanket system here runs off a 12 volt and a 6 volt rail from a little control unit at the back, and that is controlled through the power lab system using a rectal thermistor to keep core temperature at 37 degrees plus or minus uh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. So it's a fairly good, robust system, and we've been using this, for, as I said, for about 10 years now. Uh, in all of our PV studies and all of our surgical models. And uh, we like it very much. Um, however, it is a rather complicated beast to use. Um, it requires understanding of the electronics in the controller system. And although it is integrated, it is not really an integrated system. So we are always looking for improvements on that. So let's move on away from fluid support and temperature control for a second and just look at our anesthetics. I know this has been brushed upon before, but uh, in terms of cardiac function and the use of PV, uh, we have to be very careful about the anesthetics we use. Here is some data from a, a paper a long, long time ago in 1999 uh, looking at ejection fraction and cardiac output in um, rodents treated with either uh, no anesthetic and conscious, the open bars, uh, pentobarbital, uh, or ketamine and xylazine. The, the concentrations don't matter. They were obviously the concentrations that are commonly used in this uh, kind of surgery. And you can see immediately the huge impact of these anesthetics on ejection fraction and cardiac output. And in our own lab, we've uh, reproduced these data for our teaching. And you can see here that with ketamine metatomidine, which is our equivalent injectable anesthetic, uh, or isofluorane at a low 2% concentration, you still get a, a fairly um, depressed heart rate, depressed ejection fraction, and depressed systolic blood pressure. Um, and with 2% isofluorane in a free breathing animal, um, for reasons that are fairly apparent when you are using them, you'll see that you get a slightly better heart rate, slightly better ejection fraction, and a slightly better systolic pressure. So by the time you've normalized your temperatures and normalized your fluid support, you've now got the problem with understanding of the effect of your anesthetic. And of course, these effects will wax and wane as the anesthetic uh, is induced and then sustained. Of course, the depth of anesthesia is vital. And again, this has been spoken about before, but it's worth remembering the impact of anesthesia on things like heart rate and anesthetic uh, this is Deep Light and Awake again from a publication recently. And you can see there are, as we say here, considerable differences between your induction and your maintenance level of anesthesia. So for those of us who are worried about fluid support and worried about uh, the longevity of your model, um, it's very important to make sure that your model has recovered from its deep anesthetic and is light enough to be able to measure uh, decent parameters. Otherwise, you are going to be... Uh, living down in this area where you've got a lot of uh, interaction between the anesthetic and the animal and you're not going to get realistic uh, parameters. Um, we work, uh, we have worked for many years on cooling and we're interested in cardiac preservation either by cooling or by cycles of cooling and uh, here are some data simply uh, taken from a mouse with a pressure catheter in its left ventricle looking at simple changes and very small changes in temperature um, the baseline values on the left were taken at 37 degrees, and the cooling values in the center here were taken at 35 degrees, and then the rewarming was on the way back up from 35 back up to 37. And without actually looking at the numbers and averaging each of these peaks, you can see there's a clear difference between baseline and cooling. And this is only a two degree shift, and this is a drop of around five to eight millimeters of mercury systolic pressure and in fact there's a small increase in diastolic pressure which we can't explain but certainly there is a impact here of a very small difference in temperature on your parameters so if you were measuring pressure volume loops at baseline you can imagine your output will be a lot different during the cooling phase leading on from this 
Um, mistakes do happen in theatres and things get forgotten. Uh, this is an experiment we carried out to look at uh, what happens to data um, if, for instance, your heating pad malfunctioned, and on this occasion the heating pad did malfunction, and we've got baseline data here, uh, again, just looking at pressure uh, for the sake of consistency, and then as the heater turned off, turned itself off for seven and a half minutes, in fact the transformer blew up, uh, and we didn't notice until we noticed the parameters were dropping, and it took us seven and a half minutes to find a replacement transformer, um, even, even that didn't solve the problem. So the heater turned off for seven and a half minutes, and you can see here there is a drop as the animal's temperature starts to decrease. And the decrease in temperature wasn't great because the animal was enclosed. It was uh, in our little heating chamber and it should have been kept fairly warm. Uh, and then we rewarmed this animal by injecting 42 degree centigrade saline IP. Um, we injected various, we picked 200 microliters and repeatedly inject 200 microliters until the animal warmed up a bit. And you can see the data comes back to normal again. So if you're thinking about this from pressure volume point of view, it doesn't take very long to impact greatly on your data with very small uh, changes in your monitoring. So we've done some experiments over the years looking at um, adenovirus uh, gene transduction in mice and uh, David Cass published a very elegant paper a number of years ago showing um, cooling as a um, adjunct to um, adenovirus injection into the LV um, with cross clamped aorta. So we carried out the same experiments uh, that David had done and at the same time we actually had a PV catheter uh, in, the L in the LV while doing these experiments simply because we just bought one and we wanted to have a little play. So while measuring uh, core temperature of these cooled mice that were cooled on ice down to a temperature of 20 degrees and then rewarmed back up to 37 degrees, uh, the adenovirus was injected at the 20 degree time point and then the animals rewarmed. We've got readouts here on the screen of five animals each of systolic blood pressure and stroke volume. And again, um, you can see very clearly that as temperature decreases, the stroke volume has a shallow decrease and then a rapid decline, whereas, sorry, there's the systolic pressure, whereas stroke volume seems to have a slightly rapid decline, a, a slightly lesser decline, and then a much steeper decline when we get below 25 degrees centigrade. I'm, I'm certainly not saying that anybody with insufficient monitoring would allow their mouse to reach 25, 24 degrees centigrade, but you must be um, thinking about this when you're doing, when you're doing your studies. Um, these are the pressure volume data from the same cohort of mice. Uh, we're looking at temperature monitoring Again, um, LV pressure loops on the left-hand side, and you can see here 37, 32, 24, and 20. The pressure volume loops go from looking uh, how we'd expect them to something that we certainly wouldn't be expecting. And one could be mistaken to think that this pressure volume loop came from a mouse uh, with an injured heart, and certainly this mouse would have recovered perfectly decently having been rewarmed back up to 37 degrees. So I think this again just emphasizes the fact that we are all looking for the best quality PV loops and we're looking for physiologically accurate data and in this circumstance with only a small amount of cooling you can seriously impact on the quality of those PV data. So this is a screenshot of the system we have in our laboratory. It's using as I said the AD Instruments uh, lab chart and power lab system. Uh, and at the top here we have the uh, DVMs that we, the digital voltage monitors that we have um, on our screen at all times and the key one I've highlighted here in red is the temperature monitoring and we record our temperature on every procedure that we carry out it's hidden away somewhere behind the screen here um, but it's recorded on every animal so if we had to go back later and look at baseline PV values we would obviously make sure we've selected an area that has uh, normal thermic temperature of course, with that, we end up with the heart rate and other parameters to look at. But our, our key variable that we really try and monitor as much, much as possible is our temperature. Um, of course, it's quite important, and this is uh, some data from our laboratory uh, looking at temperature throughout a uh, about 12-minute um, procedure. This was a procedure actually to induce uh, an MI in a mouse, uh, and so this is the surgery from the start to the finish, and then we've I started closing the animal at this point here, and you can see we maintained temperature quite adequately between somewhere between 36 point something and 37 point something on this graph. Uh, the detail isn't really required at this stage, but you can see that it's, it's maintained consistently at 37 degrees, and we believe this is really important. 
and I'll show you why we think that's so important in a second. Um, this is a uh, image of a PV acquisition. The PV catheter is just about to go into the left ventricle of the heart. We always make sure we cover our animals' um, exposed internal organs with some saline soaked gauze just to avoid evaporative heat loss and also to avoid any um, loss in blood volume. Um, but the illustration here shows correct uh, maintenance of temperature. And if you're not recording this, if this isn't actually being logged somewhere, it may be uh, an interesting thing to have to defend later uh, when you try and publish your data uh, because you may need uh, accurate measurements of temperature to uh, reinforce some of your findings. Um, we do a lot of um, LAD ligation. We look at murine ischemia reperfusion in the heart. Uh, and I'm just going to go through three very quick slides showing you some of the techniques we use in our laboratory. There's the standard snare technique where you use a piece of PE tubing overlaid over the position of the LAD and a piece of nylon ATO suture and another piece of PE tubing which you use as a, as a conduit. Uh, and then you use uh, a bit of brute force just to pull the two sutures up through our little snare device here which is a pipette tip with a piece of silastic tubing over it. Uh, and that allows you to uh, induce a piece of force over the occlusion and, uh, and occlude the LAD. Um, from there, we've moved on to a hanging weight system. Um, this is a, a very large opening for demonstration purposes. We would normally just open a space between two of the ribs, but we wanted to get a photograph of the heart in situ. Uh, and this uses, again, a small piece of PE tubing laid on the surface of the heart, another piece of PE tubing uh, to act as a conduit, and then we apply a weight to the end of each of these sutures that are hanging over two parallel bars above the mouse's chest, which again induces a reproducible um, force on the occlusion. And you can find these, these in more detail in some literature we've published in the last few years. Um, our more recent development is a, a balloon, which is placed on the uh, left ventricle wall. The suture is wrapped around the balloon, uh, very loosely tied, and then we can inflate the balloon to induce uh, myocardial ischemia. And we've been carrying out experiments, you can see here, a pressure volume catheter in the LV of the heart. You can uh, use this system to induce MI and measure uh, effects of um, LV function. Um, we found this a, a very beneficial route because we can also now induce um, ischemia uh, in an MRI magnet uh, so we can look at uh, real-time MRI um, images while inducing ischemia. So uh, this is a really just a, an interlude to talk about um, infarction, but clearly if you're inducing an infarction, monitoring is, is very important. So uh, the message to take home from really this, if you are interested in infarction, is we all know, we don't, we don't need me to tell you that infarct size is dependent upon the temperature of the organ at the time of infarction. In fact, uh, cooling is a very good uh, preservative, as is demonstrated here on the right-hand side in this uh, figure for a paper published uh, about uh, 12 years ago. This is um, infarct size versus temperature, and a modest 10 degree decrease in temperature reduces our infarct size from around 45% down to around 8%. Um, most of us have never seen decreases of infarct size this big, even with our best pharmacological inhibition or preconditioning. So, um, it's worth being aware that only small changes in temperature can radically change uh, your ability to detect tissue injury. And of course, we are dealing with mice, but we must remember that we are translating these data into human studies, and there's no surprise that in both rabbits and sheep, we find exactly the same um, relationship. At more normothermic temperatures, our infarct sizes are larger, and at um, hypothermic temperatures, our infarct sizes are smaller. Um, so these would obviously translate into humans as well if we are trying to advocate the use of our models uh, for human research. Of course, infarction itself induces changes in the heart that we cannot measure using our PV catheters, um, but we can measure using ECG. And here we can see some rat ECGs uh, at the top, A and B, taken pre, which is A, and post MI, um, you can see the changes in shape of the ECG and B, and then underneath there in the third panel, we can see the development of VT, uh, which was self-terminating in this mouse, but um, uh, VT, even VF in places here, and you can see sinus rhythm is uh, before it. So without the monitoring of ECG, we have found 
doing rat infarction is incredibly problematic because, as we all know, the great majority of rat hearts will go into VF or all sorts of other arrhythmias um, given half a chance um, with normal uh, blood potassium. Uh, and this is just a demonstration of one of the um, conducting rubber tubes we use to monitor ECG in a rat. So this, this really moves to the end of my presentation where we look at trying to achieve uh, what I thought maybe 10 years ago was not achievable, which is a single unit that may measure everything. Um, we were grateful to Indus for sending us a mass monitor S to have a look at. Um, and this is what we've got on the screen in front of us. It gives you uh, integrated ECG, uh, which allows you to measure both limb leads and augmented leads. Uh, you get a real-time readout of heart rate, breathing rate, core temperature, blood oxygenation with a little bit of an extra module plugged in. And this allows you to either record it on the tablet itself, it's connected to a, a little tablet here, or it allows you to export the data uh, to your, in real time, to your data acquisition system. And I know that um, Graham will be talking about that in a little bit more detail. Our preliminary results with the Mouse Monitor S have shown that it seems to be a very stable monitoring platform. It uh, enables us to look at ECG changes during infarction. It enables us to look at respiratory rate and um, blood pressure changes when we're using our PV catheter simultaneously, which is very nice. Um, there doesn't seem to be any electrical interference with PV acquisition. And for those of you who have uh, used PV a lot, you'll know that uh, electrical interference is the bane of our lives, uh, and yet this system does seem to be electrically fairly quiet. And we're very happy that it produces reliable and robust ECG data from uh, the recordings we have made. Uh, and more importantly, uh, and really my, my advocate is here, it actually does support fairly robust temperature control as well. Um, so we are happy with that system, and I think it's, it's certainly the the way to move forward. Um, our standalone system has a few more bells and whistles, which we're working on at the moment, but certainly the, the mouse monitor S gives us something we can we can work on, which is a so, very uh, useful tool. Let me introduce tool. myself quickly. So I'm Graham I'll Sattler. I'm the product development manager at Indus Instruments for all of our preclinical instruments that we've developed over the years. Uh, the first one that we focused on redeveloping was the, the mouse monitor. Uh, about five years ago, we kicked off that project, and uh, we released that in early 2012, and have spent the last couple of years, you know, taking feedback from researchers and, uh, you know, finding out what it is that they like about it, what things they'd like to change, and so uh, now we've got a product that started out being quite a bit different than what we set out initially to develop, and that's all thanks to to the researchers who provided lots of feedback for us and lots of input to help steer that product into something that's more useful. To, to help them achieve their research goals and to support their, their needs. So first I want to review what we've covered in the webinar so far. Um, in our first, uh, first two presentations, we covered PV loop theory and uh, the, the wonderful Harvey app and how it helps people you know, get a handle on what PV loops are and, and what they mean. And then Transonic's first webinar uh, covered a lot of PV loop applications, and we were able to hear a number of different uh, researchers describe their, their applications and, and the findings that they've had. Finally, uh, in uh, Transonic's second webinar that happened a couple weeks back, we, uh, we heard a lot about uh, PV loop system setup tips and best practices from Dr. Konecki and, uh, and Dr. Plouffe. And uh, we also got a really nice overview of uh, PV loop surgical preparation and uh, signal optimization tips and best practices, as well as some mentions of uh, PV loop procedure documentation to, uh, to help people you know, both improve the process of capturing quality PV loops and also go back and uh, find out uh, you know, what was going at any given time in the, in in the uh, intervention. What I want to cover a little bit is I want to, I'll, my presentation will touch on uh, surgical preparation and add a little bit more detail on how the mouse monitor S can help streamline that process and make it more effective, as well as making it easier to, to document your procedure. And at the end, I'll touch briefly on um, using the mouse monitor S as a device to capture high-resolution ECG to evaluate uh, the effectiveness of the outcome. As, uh, as Dr. Clark mentioned uh, in his, at the end of his uh, MI section of his presentation. Uh, briefly, again, quick, to quickly review the capabilities of the Mouse Monitor S, we've got a, uh, a display unit over here, and then we'll have a heated surgical platform right here. These are a little electrodes on the surface of the device, and we're able to, just with a little bit of conductive cream and tape, we're able to monitor uh, 
you know, ECG, respiration, heart rate, and all these other sorts of things. I'm going to actually show you guys in the next slide a demo of this device in operation, a video capture of that. Um, and so uh, what it does is it basically we're trying to combine the, the research functions of monitoring and documentation so that uh, people can have information that supports decisions at the time of surgery and also uh, have information they can review later on to evaluate the effectiveness of that surgery and, and search for possible improvements to that uh, in a continuous process of, of improvement. So this is a video right here, and it's, I'm going to press play and show you know, a basic demo of the uh, system operation. I'll just quickly point out uh, after I press play here that uh, you know, we've got the, the waveform area. We'll have a, a title bar with, uh, with date and then a, uh, wait, uh, a numeric plot area and uh, a control button area down here. That pink uh, circle just went around all of the waveforms we've got playing in this uh, main waveform plot space where you're seeing the, the data scroll across. And then just to the right of that, you'll see the heart rate, respiration rate, core temperature, and pad temperature that are calculated from the other inputs on the mouse monitor S. So I've again circled with the, with the pink highlight the, the waveforms. We were showing ECG lead 1, ECG lead 2, and ECG lead 3. And you see them scroll across. Those are gathered from the four limb leads attached to the, the top of the surgical platform. And then I'm going to move on to, uh, to show how the, the signals can be scaled. And I'm scaling them vertically with just a small pinch. And you can see these, these hot pink highlights showing the, the, the touch of my finger on the screen. I'm also selecting an individual waveform, scaling it vertically by itself while the other signals say the same size, and then deselecting. The signal can also be scaled in the horizontal time scale. And that scales all signals at the same time, regardless of uh, selection, just to maintain some kind of logical coherence between the ECG sections. So that shows kind of the basic functionality of the, the scrolling. You'll see over here on the right, there's the, the number panel area. I just circled that. And uh, also, then what we'll do is kind of talk about the heart rate a little bit, being calculated on lead two, the respiration rate being calculated on changing chest impedance. Uh, we're not showing that signal right now since it's not of interest for most cardiovascular surgeries to see the morphology of that signal. And then also you'll see core temperature and pad temperature reflecting the, the internal core temperature from a rectal temperature probe on, on a mouse in this case, and then also the heating temperature of the pad. Next, uh, we'll go ahead and I've circled up on the top the, the name. It's a, that's the default name for the experiment, the default name for the mouse, so that you can kind of keep track of what's going on. And also the date and time. I captured this video uh, on Friday afternoon. So you can, that helps when you're doing a the screenshot function, which I've just clicked here on the bottom. And that captures all of the information in this, uh, that you're seeing right here and to, has a little message showing that we are successful so that you can come back and review that later on. I'll, I'll show some examples of this and get into more details in a future demonstration. Uh, I've also just clicked pause right here. You'll see in the bottom left that the, the icon changes and the scrolling is stopped. This allows you to kind of go in and see any additional detail you might want to see or if something interesting came up. I've clicked live again and we're scrolling. Um, so the, the data begins to you know, scroll as normal. And then there's recording, which I'll get into with my next demo video in more detail. And file playback is kind of the other half of that. So once you record a file, we can play that back. And lastly, there's the settings button. So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, to show really quickly how we can update the, the title of, the, of this particular display so that people can keep track of it. I've circled it again. We've got the default experiment name and animal ID. Now I'm going to go into settings and quickly change that so that we can um, you know, get something that makes it easier to find later when we have these uh, screenshots. So I'll go to experiment title, and I'm going to select the experiment name. I'm going to go ahead and delete the, the default. And I'm just going to put my own name in to make it easy to find. When I see the screenshot later, I'll know the researcher. And I'm also going to uh, you know, put some sort of identifier for the experiment that I'm currently working on. As in, I'm also going to delete the default animal ID and add something that uh, makes it, you know, in this case, you'd probably use something that adheres to your institutional policy of naming. I've selected M5436 just because it, uh, it seemed like it might fit. And as a file name, I'm going to add a preface for this so that when we go back and look at recordings, we can find, again, the researcher, the study name, and the animal name uh, integrated into that, 
feature. So you'll see up at the top now, instead of having those default values, you'll have gram R1271 and M5436 appended right there on the top where we can find them again easily later uh, on, on those screenshots. Uh, you'll also see the date and time on the top just as we had before. Now I'm going to move on to uh, one of the ways that the system can support documentation that's been integrated right into it. Uh, this starts off right where the previous video ends and you'll see up here at the top that, I'm going to go ahead and play, you'll see up here at the top that the, uh, the tags that we just applied from the previous video remain. So um, I'm going to let it play for a second. I've clicked stop record, start recording down here and you'll see the button flashing on the bottom. And up here on the top bar, there's a, a nice red uh, counter that kind of lets us know how long we've been recording. And so between the counter on the top and the blinking button on the bottom, you'll know that recording is active and that, uh, you know, how long you've been recording. So right here, I've taken a comment, and I'm going ahead and placing, uh, you know, a comment that tells me how much ISO I'm using, and another comment about uh, starting a closed chest baseline an open chest baseline, and I'm, I'm adding these comments very quickly to kind of move on to the playback portion. Also apologize for the typo that I have where it says SVC occlusion instead of IVC occlusion. That was uh, done in haste. So here we're in the playback mode. We're actually opening the folder. There's the file name that we typed in earlier. So I'm going to select that and open it. And as the, the device is, is working on opening it, you'll see uh, right now, this is the file that we just recorded. So it's playing back and I've gone ahead and paused it by touching it, and you can scroll back and forth, like with the, the pink uh, streaks, showing that the file can move back and forth, and you can kind of look at that detail in more depth. The horizontal scaling and the vertical scaling work the same as before. What I'm going to try to do is, is advance this over to near where my first comment is, and then I'm going to play it back to kind of show you what that looks like when you're in the review mode. I've pressed re review on the bottom. You see the little comment pop up right above these uh, little red dots. And then you're able to kind of see uh, where those comments are and what the contents of them are as the file plays back. So this can be useful if you're coming back and trying to look at the ECG morphology and the vital signs rates over here on the right pertaining to a particular event that happened in your surgery or a particular marker you dropped so you could go back and find that out. Um, Right here, I've kind of dragged it back to kind of show, again, that you can scale individual waveforms uh, outside of the playback mode. So you can kind of, if you need it, look at a little bit more detail and a little bit more uh, information, then you can do that. You can take screenshots as well in this view. And as I've just uh, done right there, the little blue button uh, shows up at the bottom and highlights the screenshot button. And uh, we're actually going to get into, here in a second, we're going to go take a look at uh, screenshots and see what those look like uh, from both the live mode and the in the recorded mode. So moving on to capturing screenshots, we'll do a quick demo right here as well. Uh, everything is set up as the same from the file recording me uh, previous menu. Everything's scrolling back and forth. And I'm going to press this screenshot button right here at the bottom. So I've pressed it, and it's going to give us a little message that lets us know that the screenshot was saved successfully. And now I'm also going to go configure a special feature that we just added uh, after some requests that we had from the fall conference season. So I'm going to show um, what's called scheduled screenshots that we've just kind of moved into. And so I press settings right here on the bottom right. And then I'm going to go to scheduled screenshots on the left. And I'm going to click enabled scheduled screenshots. What this will do is, is activate it. And you see all the options of how frequently you can have those uh, screenshots selected from 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, on up to every couple of minutes or even every hour. So I'm going to select 5 seconds to do a quick demo. And you'll see up here on the top right the scheduled screenshots indicator turning on and the monitoring sh showing up. So we'll have our first screenshot right here, a successful signal. We'll have our, sec our second successful screenshot show up right here. We're going to have another indicator. And just to prevent us from capturing a huge number of them, I'm going to go ahead and turn them off before we go to the section where we can take a review of those. Uh, one of the things I'll, t I'll make a point of, of noting is that uh, all of this information is captured, all of the information on the screen is recorded so that you can kind of come back and, and easily figure out what, uh, what was going on at that time. So this is our first example screenshot that we took. Uh, you'll see that the waveform area right here uh, over the center is, is just recorded as an image. 
and the numeric parameters that were active at that time are recorded over here. What you'll see also is the, the labeling that we set up here on the top is it remains. You'll see the, the, surge, the, the name of the surgeon, the name of the study, the name of the animal, and also the date and time that were uh, present at the time of recording. Even when you are taking screenshots from a playback recording, you will, the timestamp that goes here will be from when the original data was captured. The control bar at the bottom is a lot less useful in screenshots, so we've chosen to replace that with a bar that lets the user know what settings were used in terms of filter settings, so that if you were to come back to this information uh, you know, a couple of months or a year later, you can easily recall all the filter settings that you had activated at that time to, to produce this, this type of morphology with, you know, in a particular study for a particular researcher at a particular time in a particular mouse model. So you can kind of connect all the dots and figure out later on how to, to replicate that information. Next I'm going to show us another very similar screenshot taken from the scheduled screenshots uh, uh, menu. And you'll see this little indication that is added, but the rest of the screen is, is very much the same. You'll have the, the waveform area, the numeric area, the title area with, uh, with naming and uh, date and time, and also the, the filter data here at the bottom. So now what I'm going to do is show a little bit about how easy it is to integrate this with other uh, systems for cardiovascular research. Uh, PV Loop being the title of this uh, particular webinar, but there's many other systems that you can be integrated in this fashion. There's the capability of the Mouse Monitor S to utilize uh, our low latency synchronization solution, which is a plug on the underside of the platform that allows us to put four different signals out, and those can be configurable and customizable. Um, ECG core temperature uh, among those options and all the ECG signals the nice feature about this is they're sub 2 millisecond latency signals so they're they're very clean they're very nice for integrating into any any number of different detailed cardiovascular uh, surveys but particularly for PV loop they provide a you know a very nice solution uh, electrically, like Dr. Clark said, that we have an isolated ground power solution so that we don't interfere with these other solutions. And in fact, we actually have this custom ground cable that we, that we make and provide with the unit so that um, people can isolate the effects of any introduced noise into the system by shunting them away to the normal ground. And so this plugs into the bottom of the unit with this uh, banana jack that you'll see right here and there's a little screw jack that can be either attached to the back of a data acquisition unit They have a grounding stud on the back of all ADI uh, data acquisition boxes or screwed into the uh, ground um, screw on any uh, standard power outlet. Next what I'd like to do is show a little bit of, uh, about how to configure the software to support those uh, low latency sync outputs and I'm just going to press play here and we're kind of taking over, we're starting over uh, just where we left off in the last video you'll see the title and the configuration is the same. I'm clicking settings and going on the left, I'm going to scroll down to low latency sync out. You'll see that's selected. And then what we have here is uh, kind of in horizontal rows, we've got the channel, the drop down selector, and this uh, color indicator showing which BNC port uh, in terms of color coding corresponds to the selections that we've made. So I've circled all these color BNC ports and uh, also, I've circled the, the channel labels on the left. Uh, I've selected right here some of the drop-down options and shown how you can change those to any particular option that you might want. Duplicate signals are allowed, uh, so you can, you know, if needed, uh, trigger different devices or synchronize with multiple different systems. It, I've gone ahead and shown a configuration that's fairly straightforward of ECG lead 1, 2, 3, and core temperature. And moving on to filters, we've implemented a button that can copy the signals that you've used to set up for your acquisition and display on the system, or you can individually select those filters to be off or to have any custom value that you may want if you prefer to do the filtering on the backside or if you um, are, are satisfied with the, the filter outputs that we've selected. Uh, we can export the same quality signal, high resolution to your system and do the filtering on our side or on, on the other side. Those, both of those options are available to you. Finally, what I'd like to cover is uh, the flexibility of the system. So we've talked quite a bit about uh, you know, configuring it for integration with other uh, cardiovascular research systems, but I want to do, show a little bit more about the different ways that the display unit itself could be configured to support different types of research. 
I'm pressing play again here, and you'll see that the waveform area is the same as what we had before, and we're back taking over right where we left off with the previous video. I'm going to go to settings, and I'm going to go then to display in the waveform, where we're going to add the augmented leads that Dr. Clark mentioned earlier. So these, uh, this list on the left are the available options, and the list on the right is the ones that have been configured. And so I'm dragging over AVL, AVR, and AVF, and showing a little bit of detail about how those signals can be you know, changed around in order, dragged and dropped onto each other from the list, and then kind of dragging those back on. And then I'll click OK to show what a full six-lead ECG would look like on the system. So you'll see now that we've got six ECG leads displayed here as they scroll across, and the bottom three augmented leads displayed at the bottom, as we would expect from the configuration that we just did. I want to show that the scaling is all the same. We scaled it vertically, horizontally. All those behaviors maintain the same regardless of how many waveforms are displayed. And now I want to show a little bit of information about how we can get back to where we started. And so going to presets, I'm going to go back to a start preset that I have, where we go to the very beginning of, the, of all the demos. You'll see the default name an animal ID up at the top in the configuration that we just had. We've returned to all of those settings that we had at the beginning of the experiment with one single uh, visit to the settings and configuration for presets. Now I'm going to go to the PV loop setting, and this gets us back to the end of the first demo where we've gone ahead and changed the title and we've changed the information, but we uh, you know haven't yet gone and configured anything else. So this is a really nice way to uh, you know deal with multiple different researchers easily getting back to the configurations that they need for their particular research uh, and not being able, to, not having to you know, struggle with you know, all these different setting sets for shared devices. It also helps when you're doing different uh, types of surgery where you need to switch between certain views uh, and outputs that might be of interest to different surgeries. You might want to have an augmented leads or a full six lead ECG in one study, but then the other one you might be happy with just a lead two and a plus signal for you know, a different type of surgery. So the mouse monitor can support all that and all of those different types of functionalities can be, can be set up and adjusted and saved to support kind of the quick back and forth between different projects and different needs. So thanks everybody for uh, kind of staying here for our, the demos that we just went through. I wanted to go ahead and take another opportunity to thank Dr. Clark uh, for all the excellent information that he brought to the presentation. And also, at this point, we will uh, take a couple of questions. Uh, I'd like to encourage anyone who has any ideas or suggestions for improving the product to please send them along, because like I said, a lot of the changes and the features of the Mouse Monitor S came from researchers uh, who are more than happy to, to give us guidance and, and give us direction on what they'd like to see. So we really appreciate that guidance, and that's something that we take seriously and have integrated into the product over the past couple of years. So thank you, and uh, please, please give us more ideas. <laughs> so. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Graham. Uh, great presentation, and I know that the uh, video overview and demonstrations have been well received. Um, I think we've got a few people on that were perhaps on your first webinar. Um, and that was one of the requests, kind of, you know, going over the features live, uh, and you've certainly uh, uh, shown that today. So, yeah, let's move on to our q and I'm just getting uh, Dr. Clark online. Uh, are you with us? I'm with you, yep, great. Wonderful. All right, so, um, yeah, let's, um, we've got some questions about MI. Um, Graham, perhaps you can comment, a specific question was, are there any labs using the mouse monitor to evaluate and confirm? That, like their technique on generating an MI using the ECG morphology? Yes, yes, there's a couple of labs that we've worked with. Um, seems like we get a lot of requests for this actually, where people are looking for an easy way for them to capture ECG and to uh, confirm proper MI technique in terms of uh, end results. And uh, having the, the high resolution and low noise that we have, it's, uh, it's a definitely an ideal, solu uh, ideal application for the mouse monitor as to confirm this. Uh, do you have anything additional to, to add, uh, Dr. Clark? Well, I, I would actually just echo what Graham said. And we, we use a, uh, an AD Instruments bioamp to do all our uh, ECGs up until the use of this, this system. And yeah, noise-free ECG is actually quite hard to get. Uh, in a surgical environment when you've got 500 other machines all making as much electrical noise as they can do. So I, I, I would applaud any system that can produce noise-free ECGs, and we've certainly used it, as you've seen from our data, to characterize uh, 
ECG morphology during during MI. So yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, and I, I know think, we I know we didn't touch on that too much, but uh, without getting into too much engineering detail, uh, attention to uh, to ground to reducing grounding noise was one of the key priorities, and was something we spent a lot of effort with on the system to make sure that we could integrate really well with the variety of different approaches that uh, companies have to implementing their their different technologies and their grounding solutions. So. We've had really good response from integrations with a, a wide variety of different instruments that we're, we're capable of uh, dealing with and responding to uh, the different ways of thinking that those engineering's have, engineering teams have. So that was definitely a big, a big piece of our engineering work. And it's very fitting, uh, James, as you mentioned during your presentation for the PV loop application. It's actually critical. When you start integrating other uh, equipment that carries an electrical signal or measures one, um, uh, it, yeah, it's absolutely critical that there's time spent to uh, any effect uh, to the conductance signals and, and the way that they're collected by the pressure volume catheters. So for this particular series, that's a great point and a and, um, uh, good thing that this particular product has proven uh, uh, to work well you know, in concert with uh, the PV systems. So um, yeah, I guess uh, another question that's come in is just very simple. I mean, the mouse monitor has been presented as a solution for mice, but uh, there's been some questions about using it on other rodents. So, Graham, can you just, is there an official list where this particular system as it's offered today is suitable? Um, sure, sure. Um, we actually have a couple of different sizes of electrodes that are attached to the top of the device. So uh, there's a couple options in software to select either a rat model in different orientations or uh, our mouse model. And so we support both mice and rats, and we've actually worked with a, a lab here in Texas that uh, is working on naked mole rats, and it works just great with them. We've also uh, seen it work with a, a bat model, and okay. also uh, larger mo uh, rodent models like, um, uh, you know, a couple of other different types of rats like, um, geez, I'm not, I'm not recalling the actual varieties, but we also have a set of external ECG electrodes that supports, uh, you know, a different animal sizes and different animal uh, mm -hmm. needs in terms of electrode placement. So it actually works for a wide variety of different, uh, you know, investigational species, definitely. Okay. And, I, and actually, I assume just on that point you made about the uh, external electrodes, I mean, that's uh, a very important feature, again, for any surgical monitoring station, but something for someone to consider, and James, perhaps you can comment on this, is the fact that at times the, at the an orientation of the animal on your surgical pad um, you know, is not necessarily going to be that uh, um, uh, limbs can be taped down to collect ECG. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we we certainly don't always have our mice lying supine or prone right. on, their, on their sides. They may be uh, in any direction. I think having external probes. I mean, that's the traditional way that most of us are used to using ECG. So, having a traditional uh, either implantable or connectable probe is a very, very handy thing. Um, something else that's worth remembering, and this certainly affects us, um, is during recovery procedures, most of our vets and our home office inspectors in the UK require us to use drapes. Mm -hmm. So if you're using a drape over your brand new mouse monitor machine, you've now excluded the use of the pads because you've covered them with a drape. So um, having the external probes in that scenario is, is going to be very handy for a lot of people, I think. That's a good point. Um, okay, maybe moving in a different direction, we've had some questions about hydration. James, this goes back to uh, a few slides where you're talking about, um, uh, again, just the importance of fluid uh, maintenance. But could you maybe even by sharing your best practices in this technique, uh, is it a combination of, uh, you know, uh, delivery beforehand and maintenance during, um, uh, or maybe even re referencing some of the specific uh, disease models. Like if you're if you are conducting an MI, is it different? Um, yeah, it's 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 very interesting that I mean we've we've spent as as you know Andy many years working with SciSense in mm -hmm. helping them put together the Advantage system, uh, and with all conductance catheter systems, they are very dependent on the conductivity of the blood. Um, while maintaining blood pressure is very handy uh, by uh, infusing saline or other solutions, um, almost all of them will affect blood resistivity or conductivity. Mm -hmm. uh, and while we were working with SciSense um, in the past, we have certainly did some trials for them where we put in um, intravenous lines and perfused various uh, both uh, colloid and, and crystalloid solutions and in almost all cases, 
we saw um, changes in the PV signal, despite the fact that there were very small changes in pressure. Mm -hmm. So um, it's actually something we're working on at the moment um, in a, a model of hemorrhage, uh, trying to measure PV in a model of, um, of rehydrated hemorrhage is actually quite mm -hmm. hard because you're replacing significant blood volume with a non-conducting or superconducting uh, solution. So um, in most situations, you'll be requiring your PV in a very short duration. You won't be sitting there for five hours uh, under anesthetic analyzing data. So in most cases, we uh, do an IP injection prior to surgery starting, and uh, we work as blood-free as, as we possibly can do. And we, t we tend to get uh, systolic blood pressures between 100 and 120, so we haven't really got a big problem with that. Mm -hmm. um, I know if you're doing carotid artery um, cannulation and, and the more invasive procedures that leak a bit, um, you may have to give a little bit more IP. But we, as a, as a division, we've certainly moved away from doing intravenous perfusions simply mm -hmm. because of the dilation factor with the blood. Uh, I, I don't know if that answers the question, but certainly best practice mm -hmm. for me would not be to um, infuse intravenously, and I know that disagrees with some of my colleagues. Yeah, I, I was going to say, it's certainly it seems like one of those subjects where it, there's not an official stance. There are different ways people can approach it, and it probably is the case that it is dependent on the research model um, that one is doing, uh, you know, because you bring up a good point, uh, again, as it relates to uh, PV loop measurements uh, last practice, and, and we actually somewhat talked about this in the last session, but just to go back and, and very quickly um, uh, recap that it was the you know the step of measuring uh, blood resistivity you know using whatever uh, uh, probe or or measuring device comes with your your PV system because they all have them and they're there for this type of reason you know as an example in a hemorrhagic shock protocol you're going to have a drastic change to the blood resistivity so I think the message is uh, just as they answered with that like measure it and measure it as frequently as you can and should do as based on your experimental protocol, uh, pay attention to fluid infusion in the same way. Do it to maintain physiology, but be aware that, uh, yeah, um, uh, overhydration or, and you had that slide about infusing, you know, basically too much fluids and having these super mice, it goes on the same accord, right? We have to pay t close attention, and if anything in the mouse model, it, uh, the, the um, degree of error is, is tighter. Um, that one must work within, but it's pay attention as best as you can and manage it to your own protocol. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's no doubt that a saline perfused preparation like a Langendorf heart becomes edematous over time, and we accept that when we do our work. But if you yes. are recovering, if you are recovering a mouse and returning it to its cage and expecting an infarction or remodeling event to take place, you don't want to put it back into its cage with a um, with an edematous heart caused by overperfusion or, or overpressure. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very good. Well, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask just one final quick question, Graham. This one's for you, and then we'll we'll end the Q and A at least the live session. Uh, and as a reminder, everybody that the, these uh, this information will be will be transcribed and available for download. But um, just about changing uh, what can be viewed on the uh, mouse monitor on the tablet, uh, one can look at um, uh, basically can you plot the heart rate and the core temperature uh, over time? You know, so like usually you have this information statically on the right bar, but uh, is it exclusively that the screen when you're recording will be used for ECG traces? Yes, just like uh, we've seen on many clinical uh, monitors, we've made the decision to have all of the plots in the waveform area stay in the same time domain, uh -huh. and so that would create a heart rate and a core temperature that don't change very much relative to the ECG, and so we've chosen not to provide those as plots that you can have in the waveform area, Okay. Uh, and, and that type of uh, you know long-term meta-analysis is probably better served uh, on a data acquisition setup. I was going to say, so the the solution is there as a in a, like an as it, with an integrated mo or system to your data acquisition, which everyone will have anyways. But as far as the tablet goes, that's what the graph is is defined, uh, or or it, that's its purpose. Is is yeah. Really for and, if, and if you want to do that, obviously it's a little bit more involved. But you could uh, play back a recording, and you could visually check your your temperature and your heart rate. Uh, you know, by scrolling through the file, you'll notice that uh, you know what those what those values are as you go through the file. So it's something mm -hmm. that you can quickly determine on the device, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not supported in a in a in a plot. Okay, perfect. 
Well, um, yeah, that brings us to our close. Thanks for everybody that stayed on about 10 minutes late um, uh, or just, you know, 10 minutes past the hour. Um, uh, so, yeah, many thanks to everybody in the audience. Just quick closing notes. Uh, our next webinar in this series is Thursday, April 9th. Uh, we'll be joined by Dr. Naveen Kapoor uh, from Tufts, and, and he will be discussing PV loops uh, as it relates to, you know, translating this cardiac information from mouse to man. And uh, he's going to be presenting some interesting data um, uh, device validation, drug studies, and looking at treatments, but uh, data both from rodent models and, and also from um, uh, clinical research uh, studies. So please join us again on Thursday, April 9th. You, re you will receive uh, you know, additional notifications about this uh, uh, by email. And then finally, we also like to remind everyone that our next sessions for the Rodent Microsurgery and Hemodynamic Measurements uh, Training Program uh, at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio are occurring very soon. The introductory courses um, just at the start of April, uh, 8th and 9th, and there's a, a handful of seats left for that course. And then our advanced course, uh, which is more focused on uh, you know advanced PV loop applications, uh, generation of disease models, and and um, proper acquisition of admittance PV loops. This one is going to be held in May next, 13th and 14th and just a couple of seats left there. So if you're thinking about either of these courses, uh, if you'd like to learn more, just reach out to us. We're happy to provide you more information.